would, let's stand together. And as we get ready to worship, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we come before you today. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the sun that's shining. We thank you for your church, your people who have come and gathered together to worship and glorify the name of your son, Jesus. May you be honored and lifted up, and may our focus be solely on you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
different sort of need meditation because I couldn't decide which one I had two ideas. And so two different communion meditations. And uh, I almost dropped the one I was going to because I was so touched by that sermon. And uh, my favorite part of the sermon, you know, those that haven't heard it in for a treat, but when Stephen was talking about foolishness in your past. And I don't have a lot of blatant sin in my past, but I have a lot of foolishness. Uh, and I have this uh, sort of exceptional memory. I can remember things back 60 or 65 years, and every day I think of something really stupid I did, and like something that the Lord you know. But see, it, it was a good sermon. I love for it here and again. John chapter 14. Jesus is talking about the mansion or the, the homes, the dwelling places that he's built for us as he's talking about heaven and how wonderful it will be that one day we'll all be together in the sweet by and by and we'll be with the Lord. And he self-identifies himself in that passage in verse 6 when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You know, in order to do that, first must come to Jesus to get to the Father, to come to the Father, we must make a choice whether to follow Jesus or to walk away, whether to take that narrow road or the wide road that most everybody else is on. It's much more significant than a choice between good and bad. The good and bad is such a surface way to look at it, but this is a way of living for God and following Jesus or not. There's a great story out of World War II that has become somewhat controversial. And the reason that it's controversial is that it's perceived to be a true story, and it's about a true army officer who really lived, sort of a matter of record. But then some people later come and say, no, it's, it's fictional. And that was based on a Reader's Digest article that came out about 1953, about seven years, eight years after this happened, that was basically saying it was fictional. And I've rehearsed it, the story of Lieutenant John Blanchard, and I've come to believe that it is true. Ironically, most of the people that are saying it's too good to be true, it's Pollyannish, are of, of the same profession. <laughs> Jealous ministers. So, uh, <coughs> Lieutenant John Blanchard's story. Uh, he was stationed in Florida just prior to being sent to Europe. And he was a man of character where most of the young officers would go to the officers' club and, and look for women. It didn't matter to some if they were married or not. He instead went to the library. He really didn't want to be a part of the drinking and partying scene. And, when he went to the library, he checked out sort of a book at random. Turned out the book wasn't that great, but he was intrigued by the comments that the last individual had written in the book, a Miss Hollis Minnell, M-I-N-N-E-L-L, -L, of New York City. Those days, they put the address and everything at the back of the book, the last person to check it out. Those remarks showed sort of an intelligence, a sense of humor, sort of character, and he sort of became intrigued because he could read in the comments that she was apparently a young, unmarried woman. So he went to the library and he said, I would like to have this book. I know it's against your policy, but I'm willing to buy it and add a contribution to the library so that uh, you can buy even extra books. The librarian says it is against our policy. It so happens that I know that that book is on the shelves of the bookstores in town. And she says, so even though it's against policy, you know, it's pretty hard to turn down an army officer in uniform right prior to, well, right in the midst of World War II. And so he went, up, went back and, and had time now to finish the book at his leisure and uh, started wondering how he could get a hold of this woman. He had a hunch that perhaps she had a relative, perhaps a, a brother, stationed at the base. So he went and looked at the base roster. Turned out there was a private Manel. 
And so he asked his private Manel, would you mind if I wrote to your sister? The private said, sir, I'd be honored. And so he wrote to Alice Manel and said, uh, you know, I, I would like it if perhaps we could be pen pals. I was sort of intrigued by the margins you wrote in the book. She said, I know I shouldn't have done that. You're not supposed to write in books. He said, well, so happens I have the book. And so he went over to Europe to fight the war, and they corresponded for a year or two and found they were falling in love. So he wrote her a letter asking for her picture. And then she wrote him back and said, no, I'm not going to send you my picture. If you really loved me, what I looked like wouldn't make any difference. Finally, the day came that he was, the war was over. We won the war. And the, the troops came home with the Queen Mary. And they were to meet at noon at Grand Central Station, where that great big clock is. He, he wrote about this himself. This was also part of the Reader's Digest article when he said, as the, as the clock, second clock ticked to the noon hour, my heart was pounding. I was so nervous. And then a young woman, beautiful young woman, in a green dress that looked like spring had come alive, came up to him and said, going my way, soldier? And he said, imperceptibly, I wanted to follow her. I even took a step in her direction. And then I realized that she wasn't carrying, wearing a rose. And so he turned away, and that's when he saw the woman with the rose, middle-aged, about the age of his mother, somewhat plump. Uh, but yet she had a, a sparkle in her eyes and a nice smile, uh, you know, sort of sort of looked like a kind, intelligent person. And he thought to himself, this probably can't be true love or, or marriage. There's such a difference in age. But this might be something uh, even more wonderful, the kind of friendship that lasts a lifetime. And so he went up to the lady and said, Miss Manil, I'm glad we finally had the opportunity to meet. Would you like me to take you to dinner? And then the woman said, I don't know what this is all about, soldier, but a beautiful woman in a green dress just came up to me and begged me to wear this rose. And she said that if I ask you to dinner, that she would be waiting for you in the restaurant across the street. Lieutenant Blanchard made the right choice. You know, the woman then said, I forgot this part, she said, is this kind of, some kind of a test? I guess it was. But Lieutenant Blanchard passed the test because he made the right choice. They lived happily ever after. This morning, with Holy Communion, we can be so grateful that we made the right choice about Jesus Christ. And that's what Holy Communion is all about, his great love. His courageous sacrifice that he made on that cross, and his wonderful resurrection, the choice that he made, and the choice makes all the difference. And we can, those who have not yet made that choice, can rejoice and be glad in the fact that in the near future they have the opportunity to make that choice that really makes all the difference. Praise his holy name forever. Lord, we. Thank you that we have this opportunity to come together and fellowship with our friends at good old Smithfield Christian Church. And, and we just rejoice in the choice that we have and the opportunity that we have to make that choice. We love you, Lord. We demonstrate that love in our worship in many different ways, but in this special way of Holy Communion and ask that you, that you bless us at this time.
sorrow and in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin Your love made a way, no let mercy come in When death was arrested, my life began Was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given away. My morning grew quiet and my feet rose to dance. When death was rested and my life began. 
provide for us, that you give us our every need. And Lord, we come now to honor you through our giving, through our tithes, through our offerings. May they bring honor to your name. May you be exalted and lifted up above everything else. May you be worshipped. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 27. This morning we're going to talk about a journey, the journey of Jacob. Journeys can be fun, they can be exciting, they can be memorable. This week a group of people were on a journey off the coast of Alaska. They were on a well-watching journey. Uh, they had quite experience. I want to show you the, the video of their experience real quick. All right, wait for it. They're looking for a well. I want to see one real bad. I hope I see a well. Oh, oh, that's not oh. <laughs> 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 your money for the well journey. <laughs> Sometimes journeys are real memorable. Something crazy out of nowhere happens, and you just have that embedded in your memory forever. And it's usually exciting when that happens, but then other times in life, there are journeys that are memorable for all the wrong reasons. Though we don't do it any longer, when I was growing up, we often traveled, especially in summertime, talking about old school summer fun, our journeys were in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> we thought a pickup truck was a family vehicle. Rode across Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, all in the back of a truck. Sometimes it was open air. Sometimes it was with a capper. Sometimes it was with a slide-in truck camper. And by the way, that was the most miserable time. That trip to Missouri, we called it the trip to misery because it was miserable and memorable for all the wrong reasons. As we look at Jacob's life this morning, you're going to see some journeys in Jacob's life that were just... Memorable for the wrong reasons. And we'll see this in our text right away. We'll see that sometimes he was fraudulent. He was foolish. He was fearful. He was a fighter. He was favorable and even faithful though too. But his journey begins down a path that let's call, let's call this path he followed foolishness. Jacob had a twin brother Esau who Jacob foolishly took advantage of. A little background, Esau and Jacob, um, they were twins, but Jacob was mama's favorite. (laughs) 
And in Genesis chapter 27, Isaac was planning on giving Esau the blessing, but Mama heard this all coming about, and she wanted her favorite boy to get the blessing instead. Now, at this point, Jacob had already stolen Esau's firstborn rights for a pot of stew. He tricked him. And now it's not enough. Look at this text. You won't believe it. Verse 5. Rebekah said to Jacob, her favorite son, <laughs> Listen, I overheard your father say to Esau, Bring me some wild game and prepare a delicious meal. Then I will bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me. Do exactly what I tell you. You go out in the flocks and you bring me two fine young goats and I'll prepare them for your father's favorite dish. Then take the food to your father so he can eat it and bless you before he dies. What a foolish plan. I mean, Jacob's already fooled his, his brother into giving him the firstborn right, but now he's got to steal his blessing as well. And Rebecca, she's encouraging Jacob to fool Isaac into giving Jacob Esau's blessing. Parents, I want to point out something here real obvious. Foolishness follows favoritism. Just remember it, put it deep in your minds, and always remember it every day. Foolishness will follow your favoritism. When parents have a favorite child, it creates a lasting impact on the less favored children. And on the favorite child as well. The less favored children, they'll feel diminished and unfairly treated compared to the favorite child who feels, oh, highly valued and deserving. From being less favored, a sense of injury will develop and will be sustained. From being favored, a sense of entitlement will develop. Yeah. You don't know where the entitlement mentality comes from? It's probably from parents, grandparents favoring one child over other children, among other things. And when this happens, when favoritism happens, foolishness will soon follow. Here's a few ways we can prevent favoritism in our families. Don't compare. Just don't compare. Don't compare your child, your grandchild, to other children. Not their friends, not other family members, and not the fantasy children in your mind that are perfect. Don't even compare us to them. Don't criticize them. I didn't say don't correct them. No. Kids need correction. Remember that. All you kids in here, remember that. You need correction. If you're not training them, they're training you. But you can give them correction without being critical, without criticizing their character, without criticizing who they are. Treat them equally. Equal amount of gifts. Equal amount of praise. If we don't, foolishness will follow our favoritism. It did in Jacob's case. Jacob was foolish to steal his brother's blessing. But why did he steal it? Why did he even think he could? Why do you think he should? I'll tell you why. He felt entitled to it. He and his mother figured that he should have it because he deserved it. He was the favorite. So Jacob, he foolishly pretended to be his brother to the point of wearing his brother's clothes. His brother was a lot hairier than he was, so he put goat skin where he butchered those goats. He took the, the skin from around the neck and he put them over his arms. So if dad wanted to touch his arm, he could put it out there. Yeah, I'm hairy. Pretended to be his hairy brother. Friends, anytime we're tricking, anytime we're taking advantage of someone else, we're just being foolish. Isaac's sight was failing him. That's why Jacob could take advantage of him like this. That's why he could fool him. Yet the truth could not remain disguised. After Isaac blessed Jacob, Esau came home. Look to verse 31. Esau had done everything his dad told him to do. Esau prepared a delicious meal and he brought it to his father. Then he said, sit up, my father, and eat my wild game so you can give me your blessing. But Isaac asked him, who are you? Esau replied, it's your son. Your firstborn son, Esau. 
And then Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably, and he said, Then who just served me wild game? I've already eaten, and I have blessed him just before you came. And yes, that blessing must stand. When Esau heard his father's words, he let out a loud, bitter cry. Oh, my father, what about me? Bless me too, he begged. But Isaac said, your brother was here, and he tricked me. He had taken away your blessing. Remember that, he tricked me. Remember that that word, he tricked me. We're going to see it again in just a little bit. See, in that moment, the truth was revealed. Jacob's disguise was uncovered. Esau was furious. And look at verse 36. No wonder his name is Jacob, for now he's cheated me twice. First he took my rights as the firstborn, and now he's stolen my blessing. Esau saw his twin brother Jacob as a schemer. It's kind of how we see him too, isn't it? As a shyster, as a sly guy. Esau was sick of this foolishness going on. He was tired of it. Verse 41, Esau began to scheme. I'll soon be mourning for my father's death. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Well, Rebecca heard about Esau's plans. So she sent for Jacob and she told him, Listen, Esau is consoling himself by plotting to kill you. So listen carefully, my son. Get ready to flee to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay there with him until your brother cools off. Well, Jacob's journey that took him down the following foolishness down that road, a foolishness, as David said moments ago, we've all went down that road at some time or another. Well, all of a sudden this foolishness has got out of control, and now Jacob is what? He's fearfully fleeing. He's on the run. He knows his brother's going to kill him if he stays at home. That's when the sibling rivalry has gone a little bit too far, huh? It's over the top. He leaves for his own safety. If he would stay, Esau would get revenge. So he flees from Beersheba and he travels toward Haran. You know, fleeing ended up being good for Jacob, though. Getting away from the entitled attitude as mama's favorite boy made Jacob grow up. And Jacob needed to grow up. We tend to imagine Jacob's foolishness of him stealing his brother's birthright and then His blessing, we tend to think of him being like, what do you think, 20 years old or something? That wasn't the case. Scripture tells us that he was over 40, possibly much more older than that. I mean, he needs to grow up. It's enough of this foolishness already. I mean, this guy, if we study a timeline of this Scripture, very easily Jacob could have been closer to 60, maybe even 70 years old at this point. I mean, talking about a failure to launch... You think you got problems with a failure to launch? They got problems, right? But him being fearful wasn't a bad thing because fear would get him to stop the foolishness. Fear isn't always a bad thing. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It teaches us wisdom. Scripture shows us that it wasn't until Jacob was fleeing in fear That he displayed wisdom in his life. Before then it was all about what he could get and what mama could get him. And now all of a sudden he needs to depend on the Lord to do something rather than himself and on his mama. Look to Genesis 28. Turn over a chapter in verse 16. Jacob, he has a dream while he's out there on the run, while he's scared, while he's homeless, while he's out there not even knowing exactly where he'll go. He has an idea, but he's scared. He don't know if his brother's coming after him. And while he's in this fearful moment, he lays down to sleep for the night and his Lord appears to him in a dream, that famous dream of the stairway going to heaven. Verse 16, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the gateway to heaven. You know, Jacob, he began to make these wise choices. He began to acknowledge God's presence, which he shows us in Scripture. He probably hadn't really much before. And you know, oftentimes fear makes us make some wise choices. 
I went to the Five Love Languages conference yesterday in Indianapolis. Uh, Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote the book, he was there, and he gave us all some encouragement, enrichment for marriage. And in that seminar, he was encouraging us to, to read a book as a couple every year together. He said, you need to do this as a couple. You need to read a book together. And he said, you know, women oftentimes, it's no big deal. They'll read five books in one year on how to enrich their marriage. He goes, but you guys, you won't even read one. He said, that is until you're in trouble and you think she's leaving. Then you'll read five in five weeks. I thought, yeah, yeah, he's, he's right on that one, isn't he? Fear isn't always a bad thing. Fear helps us get our priorities in order right away. I can tell you of times that I've witnessed somebody who really behaved rottenly in life. You know what I'm talking about when somebody just behaves ugly all the time? They're just just rotten all the time. You just hate to see them coming because you know they're going to be rotten. Then all of a sudden they get bad news from the doctor. Oh, they're an angel. Out of nowhere, an angel. Aurora and I had one friend and he was really rotten and to be around and and all of a sudden he got bad news from the doctor and he began to get a little fearful and all of a sudden he was so pleasant to be around. He was kind. He was compassionate. He was outgoing. That is until the doctor gave him the all clear. He went back to being rotten. Aurora said, I liked him better when he was sick. Sometime later my friend would quit acting so stinky And he would start being more spirit-led. And he became a really compassionate, caring, kind person. And I think fear had something to do with that. And it definitely had something to do for Jacob. See, when Jacob was fearfully fleeing, he realized that he needed help from somebody other than his mama and somebody other than him. He needed God's help. So there he was. He was homeless. God appears to him in the dream, and God promises Jacob a home. There he is. He's all alone. He's lonely. God appears to him in the dream and tells him, you're going to have a family. There he is. He's fearfully fleeing and God promised Jacob protection in that dream. God was teaching Jacob that he would take care of Jacob. Jacob may not have been where he wanted to be, but God would give him what he needed as he was getting to where He needed to be. This morning, you may not be where you want to be. In your education endeavors, you may not be where you want to be. In your career, you may not be this morning where you want to be. And in your search for a spouse, you may not be where you want to be. In your singleness, you may not be where you want to be. And in your spiritual life, you may not be where you want to be. Yet God is here today. And He is with us today. And He will lead us. He will lead us where we need to be. He will sustain us. He'll give us what we need along this journey. Let His Spirit lead you. I mean, come on. In our foolishness, we see where we get ourselves. Let's let God's Spirit lead us. I believe if we do, just like Jacob did, we'll find that this journey can be favored and faithful. You know, the last leg of Jacob's journey, we could call that favored and faithful. It wasn't an easy journey. No journey just has an easy button. I mean, that's only on a Staples commercial. Life doesn't have an easy button. Life is difficult. Life's filled with a lot of disappointments. Irritable co-workers. Moody classmates. Explosive teammates. If you play on a team. Grumpy kids. Especially in the morning, huh, parents? Not so neighborly neighbors. Then there's in-laws and there's outlaws. Then the car breaks down. Then the hot water heater goes out. Out of nowhere. Sickness, stress, grief. And then the shysters come in like Jacob into our lives. Life isn't easy. I've seen the struggles in many of your lives. It's not easy. Life's a struggle. It can be difficult. But I believe if we'll be faithful, I believe we'll find favor. Jacob started being faithful, and when he did, he found favor. Jacob's journey of fear led him to the love of his life. Now look at 
over to Genesis chapter 29. It's starting to get really, really mushy now, ladies. You'll like this. Jacob, verse 18, Genesis 29, 18. Ladies, turn over there. You're really going to like this part, okay? Jacob was in love with Rachel. He told her father, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your youngest daughter, as my wife. That's love. Any of your husbands work for seven years for your father (laughs) so you could be their wife? What was their culture back then? You just didn't come and say, yeah, I'm going to marry your daughter. No, you came with something to offer. Well, Jacob didn't have anything to offer at this time in life. He's on the run. He's poor. All he had was his labor. He said, you know what? That one right there, your youngest daughter, I'll work for seven years if you'll let me marry her. Genesis chapter 29 verse 20. So Jacob worked for seven years to pay for Rachel, but his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but a few days. Wow, that's love. (laughs) Finally, the time came for him to marry her. I fulfilled my agreement, Jacob said to Laban. Now give me my wife so I can sleep with her. Now he's a brave young man, isn't he? (laughs) He's brave or stupid. Jacob's like, today's the day. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. Since the first day I saw my love, life is good. Jacob is happy, happy in this moment. He's excited. It's finally his wedding night. He has a lot to be excited about. Now let's look back, though, to verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The older daughter was named Leah. And the younger one was Rachel. There was no sparkle in Leah's eyes. But Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Now if we would do a study of this verse, verse 17, from all the Hebrew text, what we come to the conclusion is, is that Rachel is hot and Leah is not. Okay? Just do that. Make it real simple. Hot and not. Okay? Remember that. Now let's look on over to verse 22. Genesis 29, 22. So Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood and he prepared a wedding feast. All right! Jacob's like, yes! Today's my day! But then that night when it was dark, oh, this is bad. Laban took Leah to Jacob and he slept with her. Did you catch what just happened? Do you remember that word I told you a minute ago when the blessing came around where he tricked Isaac? Oh my. Verse 25. But when Jacob woke up in the morning, he goes, Oh, it's Leah! (laughs) What have you done to me? Jacob raged at Laban. I've worked seven years for Rachel. Why have you what? Tricked me. Why have you tricked me? It's not our custom here to marry off the younger before the older, Laban says to him. It's, it's just not our custom. Shyster meets a shyster, huh? <laughs> but Laban said, but wait until after the bridal week's over and then we'll give you Rachel to provided you promise to work for me for what? Another seven years. So Jacob agreed to work seven more years. A week after Jacob had married Leah, Laban gave him Rachel too. I want to point out something here. I believe earlier in Jacob's life, when he was following foolishness, at this moment, when he got what he wanted, when he got the woman he wanted, early before he had paid his, his debt for her, I believe the foolish Jacob would have said, baby, let's get out of here and leave your ugly sister behind. Just being real with you here for a moment. (laughs) Let's get out of here. We got to go. I believe that's what he would have done. He would have got what he wanted and he would have just left. He had not held up to his agreement. But that's not who Jacob is anymore. Do you see this? This time where he was fearfully fleeing has changed Jacob and Jacob was faithful. He was faithful to that agreement. And he stayed and he worked for Laban the additional seven years. 
Do you see a change in this man? I see a change in this man. And because he was faithful, Jacob was favored. Genesis 29 and 30 is all about all the kids he had with Rachel and her sister and all those, you know, their, their servants. It was a mess. It's a, just a big old mess. You'll have to read it for yourself. But in the midst of that mess, I mean a mess that Jerry Springer can't even touch. God says, there is the faithful man that will be Israel. This will be the family that my son will come into. This will be the lineage for the Messiah to be born. Out of who? Out of foolish Jacob? Yeah. And God showed Jacob favor. And not only did he have many sons, but he also had great wealth. We read in verse uh, Genesis 30, 43, Jacob became very wealthy with large flocks of sheep and goats and female and male servants and many camels and donkeys. This is like saying today that Jacob, he had Maseratis and Corvettes and employees and fields and stocks and bonds. Yeah, I mean, this guy would have been on cribs. He had it all. He's loaded. But not only is Jacob loaded, Jacob now has courage. To be a man of his word. Jacob has the courage to stand up to his father-in-law who took advantage of him and go to that favored land that God called him to go to. Jacob had the courage to go and make peace with his brother Esau that he had taken advantage of. We read in Genesis 33, 4. I want to back up here for a moment. Esau is Jacob's twin brother. How many twins do we have in the room? You're closer to your twin than anybody. You love your twin as far as your siblings. You guys have a special bond. Now imagine with me, I know none of you would do this to your twin, but imagine with me that you did your twin completely wrong and you took something from them that was very valuable. And the last time you saw your twin, they said, I am going to kill you. And you ran for your life and you're on the run. I want you guys to imagine this next verse. Because when Esau and Jacob, when they met again, Esau, he ran out to meet him and he embraced him and he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him and they both wept. The twins were reunited. The twins, all the the wrong was gone. It wasn't there anymore. And they were just happy To see each other. Now that's favor. When you have peace in your relationships with the people you love in your life, that, my friends, is favor. And if you don't have peace in the relationships with the people you love, you know what I'm talking about because no matter what you have, you're miserable because you're not at peace with the people that you love. And that's where Jacob was. And now all of a sudden, what's Jacob? He has favor. He's at peace with his twin brother. He was favored by God. He was given a new name. Genesis 35.10 Your name is Jacob, but you'll not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. Jacob's journey of becoming Israel wasn't overnight. It wasn't easy. It wasn't perfect. I'm going to tell you, it was favored. It was favored. Israel means... He who prevails with God and overcomes. The church is made up of people like Jacob who prevail with God and overcome. Some of you came here this morning, you had maybe a little thought in your mind that, well, I don't know why I'm going there because those people are all, they're just perfect and they got their lives all together. I mean, just look at them. Look how happy they are. They got it all together. I want you to know, we don't have it all together. We don't have it all together. We're Jacobs. Like David said, we have this foolishness paths that we follow. We have these fears that we faced in life. And luckily we faced those fears because it made us reach out to God. And we're just people who have put our faith in the only one that's truly been faithful in this world, which is Jesus Christ. See, the Bible says... For all is sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Like Jacob, we 
all have foolish sin in our lives. But then the Apostle Paul completes that sentence with this verse. He said, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. According to Webster's Dictionary, to justify means to be free of blame. So when Paul said we've been justified, he said we're not going to act like Don's phone rang in the middle of church and he ran out and he comes back in. We're just going to act like that didn't even happen. We're not going to look at it. We're not going to make him want to feel embarrassed. He said, no, because you've been justified by the redemption that came through Christ Jesus our Lord on the cross. You've been justified. So you don't need to look around. You don't need to point out somebody else's sin or when their phone rang in church. You don't need to do that. Hey, I remember Diana that time. You're... No, you can't do that, Stephen. No, you can't do that. Kyle, I remember. No, no, you can't do it. No. Why? Because we've been justified through the redemption that came through our Savior, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the debt of our sin is completely paid and is no more. Is that good news for anybody here? That the foolishness is no more. I believe that's what I would call favor. How about you? That's prevailing with God and overcoming. And this morning you may come here with a lot of grief in your heart. I want you to know you can prevail with God and overcome. You may come here with a secret addiction that only you know about or you think only you know about. I guarantee others know about it too. I just want you to know you can prevail and overcome it with God. Maybe you come here this morning with a lot of marital struggles in your life. You're like, man, I wish I'd went to that five love languages conference with you yesterday. We definitely would use some love. I want you to know that your marriage can prevail and it can overcome these trials of God. See, whatever it is you're dealing with, through redemption, through Christ Jesus our Lord, through His cross, where He died for our sins, we can prevail on this, this journey. We can be faithful because the faithful, He wants us to be favored. Let's put this real. You may have foolishness in your past. And I get it. You can't change that foolishness, Right? You you can't change what's on your record. You can't change that foolishness in your past. But I want to tell you, because of Jesus Christ, you can let your past pass. You with me? The past can pass. You can pass it. It's in the slow lane. You pass it. It is no more. It's gone. Your spouse may have some foolishness in their past. That they can't change. And you think it's your job every now and then to remind them of it, don't you? I just want you to know, because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection from His grave, you can let the past be in the past and you can let this brand new day that we've never lived in ever before, if we lived in this brand new day, you can let this brand new day that's never been lived in be the favorite gift of God to you and your family. But you're going to have to let... The past being the past. Why? Because through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ, we are justified. And by His grace, it is no more. So the choice is yours this morning. It is absolutely your choice. As David said, it's your choice. Now you can be foolish if you want to. No one can stop you. You have your own free will. You can be fearful of the future with no faith. And you just think it's all just, oh, woe is me. It's so terrible out here. It's terrible. And just wait till the midterms come. It's going to be just even worse. You can sit up there and turn on all the news channels and just weary and be fearful of the future. You know what you could do? You could receive the favor that's found when your faith is in our faithful Lord Jesus Christ. Quit worrying about all that other stuff. Here's what Jesus says to you this morning. I knock. I knock at the door. I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my
my voice and you open the door, I'll come in. Here's reality. Jesus has been knocking in some of your hearts for a long time. And you've heard his voice in the past, but you said, no, I'm going to go my own way. Jesus says to you this morning, if you'll just hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into your life. And I pray this morning that's what you'll do. I just pray that you will open the door to your heart and let Jesus come in. And you'll find the favor that's found when you put all your faith in Him. Let's stand. Lord, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we are grateful and thankful that we're not in the foolish past, but we're in the favored time of faith right now. And if there's someone this morning that's never opened that door to you and let you come in, I pray that today will be the day. I pray that today will be the day we get to celebrate with them the wonderful decision we make when we put you, the Lord of our lives. Lord, we, we've fallen short, we know that, but we know that you did not. So we surrender at your feet today and we are just give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.